Tina and I were sitting at a restaurant a few days ago, and I overheard a young woman talking about her aunt's failure to make the hard choice of taking her father, the young woman's grandfather, off a ventilator. And her aunt's decision, of course, prolonged her grandfather's life, and as a young woman saw it, also his suffering. And according to this young woman, her aunt couldn't make that hard choice. But I sort of wonder how prepared, how ready was her aunt to make this hard choice. As Philip Brooks has written, someday in the years to come, you will be wrestling with the great temptation or trembling under the great sorrow of your life. But the real struggle is here and now in these quiet weeks. For now it is being decided whether in the day of your supreme sorrow or temptation, whether you shall miserably fail or gloriously conquer. See, Brooks is talking about being prepared to make hard choices. And I firmly believe being prepared to make hard choices depends upon where we are centering our lives. A few years ago, this came really to me a little bit more firmly as I was invited to sit on a panel discussion at Mahanasan High School in a suburb of Albany. And I was asked to come and speak on this panel about torture and discuss why I had publicly spoken against torture as a Christian clergy person at a time when the Bush White House was publicly asserting the need to torture people. And as I listened to the panelists discuss, discussing their perspectives, and just by the way, nobody was for torture, I realized that they were all stating their positions based upon where they were centering their lives. And my final comment to the students, who were all graduating seniors, was very simple. It was this. You will have a lot of choices to make as you go out into the world. And what is vitally important to know is where you are centering your life. For if your life is centered on money, then every decision and choice you make will put you in a place to acquire money. If your life is centered on preserving the earth, then every decision and choice you make will aid in preserving the earth. And if your life is centered on God, then every decision and choice will seek God and seek God's way. Interestingly enough, this same conclusion is now being reached by a growing number of economists, political leaders, and expert commentators who are calling for better measures of how to, to determine how well society is doing. Measures that track not just our economic standard of living, but the overall quality of life. And this shift also mirrors the way many people are feeling today, that the modern consumer economy has failed to deliver fair outcomes and fulfilling lives, according to Mark Williamson in an article on the website dailygood.org. And it seems, as Williamson points out, that there is a growing concern that too many people in the contemporary world have centered their lives increasingly in serving the economy rather than the other way around. And this is leaving them with the realization that decades of growth and material progress have failed to deliver the good life that advertisers and politicians have said it would. Indeed, according to a 2011 study, many people who appear successful in outward material appearances are actually suffering serious emotional and psychological trauma because they have traded their connection to family, friends, and community for society's idol of success that can only give the illusion of well-being. And yet, to change their lives will mean that they will have to choose a new direction. They will have to choose to center their lives in a new and different way. Because as Stephen Covey wrote in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, until a person can say deeply and honestly, I am what I am today because of the choices I made yesterday, that person cannot then say, and now I choose otherwise. 
which makes the question, where are we centering our lives as a church of Jesus Christ? A much more important question to answer. And I think that the answer resides in the vision that Peter saw at Simon the Tanner's house of animals and creatures being lowered down on a sheet with God's voice telling him to go kill and eat. But see, this vision has a little bit of a problem for many commentators because they get wrapped up in saying, well, is this a vision about food? Is God teaching Peter that there are no longer any prohibited foods and that all food is okay to eat? Is the dietary teaching that Peter has been faithfully keeping all of these years now going to be changed with God's word, what has been made clean, you must not profane? And while Peter is baffled about this vision and what it means for him, the Holy Spirit tells him three visitors have come looking for him. And the visitors request that Peter go with them. And because God has already told Peter to go with the three men, he, of course, then on the next day goes with the three men. Peter has no idea where he's going or why. But because he has centered his life in God, he trusts God is leading him to where God wants him to go with a purpose God will then tell him about in due time. For now, Peter, like Mary in her wonderful song of trust, discipleship, and commitment, can only say, Lord, I don't know where you are leading me to go, but here I am on the road. And when they arrive at Cornelius' house, Peter has to make a choice. Do I go inside and break the law about Jews not entering Gentile houses because to do so will make a person unclean and impure? Or do I stay outside? What is it that God wants me to do? And here comes the aha moment for Peter. Because he realizes that the vision he had back at the house of Simon the Tanner wasn't about food at all. It was about people. God is telling Peter Peter, that no person is beyond God's care compassion, or gospel. All people are to hear the good news of Jesus Christ because God desires all people to change the direction they are journeying in their lives and turn toward God and God's ways. See, God doesn't play favorites. God's grace is for everyone. The old divisions, the old domestic household and table time problems of well. Who's allowed to eat at our table that kept Jews and Gentiles apart are no longer valid. Everyone can eat at the same table because it is not my table, it's not your table, it is God's table. Where all are welcome and valued as if God was a father standing in the middle of the road watching and looking for his lost child to come home. And this is the joyous possibility for community toward which God is leading all people to embrace. Here, you see, is a powerful and radical word of healing and hope for a world that that really runs counter to the vision of the world where those who are centered only in themselves, in their wealth and in their power, are allowed to create division and discord so they might keep communities and nations separate and hostile toward each other because that is the only way those people who are centered in their wealth, in their power, and in themselves can stay in control of the world. It is also a radical word for those who have forgotten how God stepped into the lives of Hagar and Ishmael in the middle of the wilderness when all of Hagar's hope was gone and she sat listening to the cries of her child dying in the wilderness without food or water. There in that situation of hopelessness and powerlessness, God acts by providing water, by promising to be present with Ishmael for the rest of his life and make him a nation. You see, we often fail to recall that God not only blesses Isaac 
as the inheritor of God's promises to Abraham. But God also blesses Ishmael with promises of life and community. God doesn't play favorites. God's grace is for everyone. And yet this is still not an easy word for people to hear today, especially when we are bombarded by those who call us to play who is God's favorite today game, either by spewing hatred for people who are different, ethnically, religiously, sexually oriented, and the guise of being real Christian, or by using being a Christian as a way of gaining political advantage, or using select scriptures to stop any serious conversation about solving problems they don't agree with. But if we are to claim that Jesus is Lord of all of life, then there can be no partiality, no playing of favorites. One cannot have a Lord of life be only the Lord of part of creation, only the Lord of part of humanity. Any person, anywhere in the world who trusts God, acts in obedience to God's command to love God entirely with their being and love all those whom Jesus loves is acceptable to God. And there's one thing that you will also notice, you can go back and reread that section in Acts, and that is that Peter in his speech repeats the Christian proclamation and also repeats what he has witnessed for himself but he does so without trying to find proof texts that will validate what he is saying. And he doesn't because there aren't any. Peter is struggling with this new teaching God has shown him in the movement of the gospel, a movement confirmed by the Holy Spirit being poured out over the Gentiles to the amazement of the Judeans who were with Peter. And all that Peter can really say is, who can withhold baptism from these people? Well, no one can. For the Holy Spirit has blown where it will blow, and now the church must follow where God is leading it to go. And that's the way the gospel was spread throughout the world in the first three centuries of the church's existence. That's the way all the people were taught, all that Jesus taught the apostles and how they were all then baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I think for those of us who are the church today, this is still the way it needs to happen. We still need to say that because Jesus Christ is Lord of all of life, we have the adventurous task of penetrating new areas of his lordship, expecting surprises, expecting to discover new implications of the gospel which cannot be explained on any basis other than the Lord has shown us something we could not have seen on our own. But let me be clear, this is not a call for undisciplined flights of fancy that asks us to let go of the foundations of our faith under the illusion of seeking bold new ideas. Nor is it a call to engage the pitiful effort to catch the wind of the latest trend in the culture around us under the, under the disguise of seeking new revelation. It does, however, mean, and it is the reason I played Paul Desmond's music this morning, that we are to become jazz Christians who are steeped in the foundational structures and traditional practices of the church and who are actively innovating those structures and traditional practices as well as improvising within them as we seek to penetrate even more deeply the significance of the scriptural witness that Jesus Christ is Lord of all of life and how that witness is really God prodding us to go to the new place God is leading us to go. You see, my brothers and sisters in Christ, when it comes right down to it, faith is very often a breathless attempt to keep up with the redemptive action of God as we keep asking ourselves the question that God-centered people always ask. What is God doing now and where on earth is God calling us to go now? 
Amen.